Let's go directly into module one. I call it Climate Change 101. Let's remember that we have the sun. And the sun is the key driver for all the energy that and all life that we have on Earth, which is very good because the sun is so trustworthy. All the sun is for us is a sole provider of energy. About 99% of all the energy, all the heat we get on the surface of the earth comes from the sun. And the only difference is at the poles, near the poles, the angle of incidence is bigger. The amount of area covered here is greater by the same amount of energy that is covering at the equator. And hence, therefore, we have cooler climates towards the, uh, towards the uh, poles, whilst at the tropics, around the tropics, we have warmer climates because all of the heat, all of the energy is concentrated into that small area compared to the larger area here at the angle of incidence is, is, great, is smaller uh, uh, towards the poles. So what happens to the incoming solar radiation? It, uh, it is almost constant. All the energy that we get from the sun is al almost very constant year in, day in and day out. Of course, it's going to vary from one season to the next, but all of this is almost, um, all of it is visible light. There's a bit of infrared light energy and there's a bit of uh, uh, ultraviolet light, uh, uh, light as well. And we'll look at it that this guy called Wayne, he came up with, a relationship between the color of light and the temperature, such that most of the energy that the sun is emitting is the shorter wavelength. So it may be scattered, it may be reflected, and it can be absorbed. All of this energy, which we call solar radiation from the sun. So only three things can happen to it. We can scatter it, reflect it, and absorb it. So it, the energy processes that happen to the Earth and inside that we see in the atmosphere are either a result of scattering, reflection, or absorption of the energy that comes from the sun. So it is important that we understand that, therefore, the energy coming in from the sun must be equal to the energy coming that the Earth is giving up. The Earth must not become warmer and warmer with time. The Earth should not retain for itself the energy from the sun. It is very important that the incoming energy from the sun and the outgoing energy from the sun are in balance. And for this to happen, we have things that drive the changes in the atmosphere. These changes can either be natural processes, things that, that are naturally occurring, things like volcanoes, uh, things that are a result of tectonic plate movement, changes in the sun's orbitals, or shifts in the Earth's orbit. But there's also the most important thing that is changing the Earth's climate, and that is related to human activities, especially those activities that release the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Now, let me just go into the six influences of the natural causes of climate change. Um, we all know now that there are plate uh, the, the, the earth is made of several plates. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's like a, uh, a tortoise skin shell, all put together very nicely. And 
along these different uh, plates, we have tectonic movement. And that's what causes all the earthquakes and earth tremors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these have been going on and on for millions of years. And therefore, climate has always changed in the past. Also, we've also had volcanic eruptions. We have had, as, as the volcanoes erupt, they throw large amounts of ash, dust, and smoke. And sometimes these last very long amounts of time suspended in the atmosphere. And as a result, sometimes they partially block the transmission of solar radiation to the Earth's surface for long periods, months, or even years. And therefore, they can cause a cooling of the temperature and therefore some bit of natural climate change. As a third one, we also know that the sun itself is like a glowing charcoal. Sometimes it is bright red, but we don't see it because, again, remember, it's dangerous to look at the sun, so don't, don't try that at home. But we now understand as earth scientists, as climatologists, that the, the amount of solar radiation coming out of the sun is not, although it is uh, near constant, it is not always very much constant. The amount of uh, variation from one year to the other is very, or one millennia to the other is very, very small. And it doesn't take, last very much long. But we know that these long-term and short-term variation in solar intensity also affect the global climate. There's a guy called Milankovic, he's, he's, he's late already, um, but Milankovic studied the Earth's orbit, and he found that although sometimes we're saying, uh, assuming that the Earth is revolving around the sun and rotating around its own axis, those two orbitals are not necessarily uh, uh, perfect uh, cycles. They have changed, there's, he's described changes in the cyclical, uh, 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 the cyclical changes in the eccentricity of the earth and the obliquity of the amplitude of the procession of the equinoxes. So in a sense, therefore, what he's saying is the earth is like a, a wobbling uh, uh, circulation. It, 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 it's not a perfect circulation. And these variations in the earth's orbit, therefore, both in the rotation and in the ro uh, revolution around the, uh, the sun lead to changes in the seasonal distribution of sunlight. And therefore, uh, these affect and have affected in the past climate. And these are natural. There's nothing you can do about them. And the ocean also plays a very important and fundamental part of the Earth's uh, 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 climate system. And there's been descriptions already about how these the ocean affects and therefore one one such a very circulation is what is called the walker circulation where we we'll, we have um, um, the el nino southern southern oscillation uh, affecting you know every time the sea surface temperatures goes up we get uh, a drying and we have different climates, and we know, for example, in Southern Africa, that El Nino, almost 70% surety, that we're, we're getting drought, whilst at the same time, El Nino, for each Af African uh, coastline countries, it means floods. So you can see that whatever happens in the ocean will affect the climate albeit on, on a very new, uh, sh short term, et cetera. But then there is the human influence. We now know that human activities are possible contributors to climate change and that these have, are influencing the um, climate. I'll go in, I'll, I've given you a few slides, about three slides on 
uh, Fourier and how he came up with this concept of the climate change and the greenhouse gas. It's a very old uh, concept, the greenhouse gas. What Fourier said was, well, without the atmosphere, if we didn't have the, if the earth doesn't have the atmosphere, uh, we could have the earth's temperature being as much colder by about minus 18 degrees Celsius. So the, earth, the atmosphere that we have is very, very important for us. We need to uh, make sure we look after it. It's not very thick. The thickness of the very active atmosphere for us is about between 20 to 30 kilometers. This is a very thin, delicate uh, layer above us. And that was the realization that Joseph Fourier uh, uh, reminded us as early as 1827, that we must look after the, this something very uh, precious. And that he, he is the one who coined the word, the greenhouse effect. He said, this little, a thin layer of the atmosphere where we find all the gases are nicely mixed. Uh, uh, it is so important to us that it keeps the earth warm, like a greenhouse would for tomatoes or for whatever project you're looking at. And what's in the atmosphere? We know that what we know, we have water vapor, we have carbon dioxide, we have methane, we have halo carbons that we have now generated with the new discovery of uh, uh, um, uh, chemicals, etc. And then we have nitrous oxide and ozone. So the greenhouse gases that we'll be talking about are, are largely these uh, sort of gases that we find in the atmosphere. Like we said, energy in must be equals to energy out. We will find that as the light comes in from the sun and it is incoming shortwave radiation from the sun, 20% of it is reflected by the clouds. 4% of it is reflected by water and land surfaces. 3% um, of it is backscatter. And mostly it is absorbed by the land surface and water, about 51%. Now, every time it is absorbed by the atmosphere, we start seeing the atmosphere give us a manifestation of the energy that it possesses. So, for example, the, 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 atmo the energy in the atmosphere can be, uh, can be described as either kinetic energy, which we call wind, electric energy, which we call lightning, sound energy, which we call thunder, et cetera, et cetera. But there's one very important energy, which we call latent heat of energy, hidden heat. And that energy that is absorbed by water water vapor particularly, and as water evaporates, the result is water vapor. And water vapor itself has hidden heat because some of the energy is used in the evaporation process. You need to heat water to turn it from liquid into water vapor, just like you do with your kettle when you make tea. So it is important that the amount of energy that comes in from the earth, from the sun, is equals to how much the earth gives out so that we have an energy balance of the atmosphere. If you start increasing the amount of water vapor or evaporation or heating here or backscattering or any other form of incoming uh, energy, then you are going to change the energy balance between the energy in and energy out. 